We at this venue and we set up a triple layer backdrop. Now, you know, I'm the draping queen, so I'm going to go all out and I want to be bedazzled and I want to do all the things because this is my opportunity to show the world what I could do, right? So I put all this fabric on, not even taking in consideration the weight of this fabric because I was using a lot of velvet and things like that. So we put it on, we design it, it goes up and I'm sitting there and it's like, a, a disaster happening in slow motion. It's, it was like, is that really about to fall? Is it about to tumble? What's about to happen? Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Raising the Ball, which is the number one event draping podcast on the internet. And as always, I'm your fabulous host, Precious Stevens, aka The Draping Queen, bringing you all the ins and outs of the event draping world. Now, here at the Posh Academy, guys, we only believe in dropping gems. So in every episode, we discuss the secrets, the challenges, and the untold stories of event draping. So let's drape it up and dive in. So guys, in today's episode, we're going to be discussing common newbie mistakes in event draping. And I felt as if this was important because a lot of beginners get in and they make all the mistakes that, you know, most of us did, including myself. And I wanted to create this video to help you guys get on the right track and prevent you from making those mistakes. And who else to tell you than me? Mistake number one is neglecting fabric quality. I know it's tempting to kind of go for the cheapest option, but trust me guys, investing in premium fabric really pay off in the long run. For one, they drape better, they look more elegant, and they make your design stand out. Now, I know you guys are probably getting all the stories about people telling you go to this vendor, go to that vendor so that you can save your coin. However, you end up knocking at my door because you find out that they are not as elegant or the quality that you guys deserve or that you're trying to attract the kind of clients you want to work with, right? If you're trying to really attract higher paying clients, it's going to pay you the invoices that you want that make you happy and scream for joy. Trust and believe they're looking for quality. And with draping, that's kind of really where it lies. It lies in quality and in skill set. It lies in your fabrics as well. So don't go for the cheapest option, guys. If you go for the cheapest option, guess who you're going to attract? You're going to attract bargain basement Betty. And I already know y'all guys already told me that is not who you want to work with. So what I would like you to consider instead is if you must absolutely buy affordable fabric, you want to pair it with premium fabric as well. So I am not opposed to buying the economical stretch blends because you see everybody buying those on the internet and you see everyone designing with them. However, if you're looking to stand out, I would highly advise you to pair it with some sequin, but some premium sequin, pair it with some velvet or some floral print or something that's really going to make it stand out because it's not going to stand in premium land on its own. That brings me to this story that I just feel compelled to share with you. I, you know, stand here today as a draping queen, but that was not always the case. Guys, when I first got in, I learned different things that I actually practice today. And one of those things was satin fabric. I kind of develop a love-hate relationship with satin fabric because it just requires maintenance, right? And it requires a lot of uh, technical skill to manipulate it. And I use this fabric and I purchased this fabric. Not only was it satin, but baby, it was cheap. It was cheap satin. And it just looked horrible. I did not know it took like extra work to steam it and get the, fa the wrinkles out. And I was just, do you have a design something and you kind of you're there now at the event so you kind of got to go for a throttle but you feel something in your gut saying why did you do that and that's really how I felt I felt like I don't know like a fraud but I didn't know no better because this is what I was taught right but I know that some of you guys have to be able to relate to this story because so many people come to me what kind of fabric should I get like that's a common issue in the industry so definitely pay attention to mistake number one Okay, so that brings us to mistake number two, and that is overlooking venue assessments. And the thing is, not really scoping the venue beforehand can lead to disaster. I get it. I get it. No one really wants to take their time to go and do a site visit unless you really know that this is your client. However, sometimes when they still are a potential client, this is really how you show up and your professionalism, right? You wanna actually take time to visit 
measure and understand the space. And this is going to make sure that any kind of ideas that you have relative to your design actually match the venue. It's nothing worse than you assuming or better yet, just taking the planners, uh, whatever they tell you. Right. And then you're going to the actual venue and you're going to set up and then everything is all wrong. Or what's even worse, if you have obstructions in in place of your design, right? It could be things like a fire hydrant. It could be things like an exit sign. It could be things like nowadays, a lot of the events are taking place at like industrial places, right? So the ceiling structure is not what you would normally think it is, which makes a big difference in your design. Because if you have variations where there may be air ducts in the way, that is going to mess up your entire design, right? So these are things that you really won't know unless you get a complete floor map or some kind of diagram from the venue itself, unless you go to the venue. And that's the things that kind of, not to mention, just imagine if you were looking for an event, right? Or if you was looking to hire someone and someone like, okay, I'm going to go actually do a site visit as opposed to someone saying, can you see me to the, can you send me the dimensions? How would you feel? I know for me, I would take the person that's actually going to do the leg work and the brunt work. I would take them more seriously, right? I would feel as if they really want to bring my vision to fruition and they don't want no mishaps to happen on event day. And that's why these people are hiring you in the first place. So that's really for your design, right? But you also got to consider, guys, your equipment. Now, so many of you buy equipment from various different vendors and get, I get it, right? But we create various different sizes. You may have the Posh Basic Kit. You may have the Premium. You may have the Platinum Kit. There's no telling really what you have. But in order for you to make sure that you're going prepared with the proper equipment, you won't know unless you actually go again to the venue. It's nothing worse than going and you're assuming, right, that your 7 to 12 uprights or your 8 to 14 uprights is perfect. And then you get to the space and find out they're entirely too tall. And the reason I shared that is because that is what happened to your girl. I had a venue that I did not go to the, you know, to do the site visit. I just took the words for verbatim for what they said it was. And yeah, we got standard ceilings. And back then there was no Porsche Academy. So we didn't have the six to 14s or the more convenient kits available. Right. So I had, I believe eight to 14s and boy was those suckers a nuisance. Cause I would always need a stepping stool or a ladder in order to complete my design. But needless to say, I got to this venue and you know, they had standard ceilings, which I was told. So I'm just assuming, okay, I'm, I'm cool. I go in and I go to stand the upright up and it wouldn't even stand up. The, sta the ceiling itself was like right at eight feet. And so it would not stand up. And it was just like kind of a disaster. Um, but you know how we do. We get in there and we make things work. A good thing about this particular venue, they had the, the ceilings like the pop outs. So, you know, to me, it looked crazy, but they didn't care. They just wanted their design up. And all of that could have been avoided, guys, if I just went to the freaking venue from the jump. So here we are at mistake number three, and that's ignoring light considerations, right? Lighting, guys, is everything in event design. Lighting is everything nowadays in almost anything, When it, even when it comes to content. Look at my lighting behind me. It looks fabulous, right? But failing to factor it and really can result in your draping looking dull or it could look mismatched. It could just look a hot mess. You always want to consider the lighting conditions at any venue because lighting is the thing that kind of sets the tone. Lighting is something that really makes people feel a certain kind of way, right? You can set a certain lighting and make people feel a little sexy. You can set a lighting and make people feel excited. So you really want to make sure your lighting is accentuating the work that you design. It's nothing worse than you going to put all that hard work into your design and the lighting is dull, it's dim, and no one can really see it. And all of this really could have been avoided if you just maybe use some up lighting, right? You want to reflect your work. You did all that work. You set up all that time, you want people to see it. So definitely take in consideration what the lighting looks like at the venue, because if it's anything that you need to brighten up or create, bring some extra tools or some extra elements to brighten up your work, don't be afraid to do so. And another thing with lighting, guys, is it kind of sets you apart, right? If you just have, let's just say the same backdrop, but you have it in exhibit A and you have the same backdrop in exhibit B, but it has those up lights on it. 
nine times out of 10, more people are going to be drawn to exhibit B just because it gives more elements of depth. It gives more elements of design and it just gives a more polished look, meaning you're showing up as the professional. Now, if you don't have up lights, guys, I get it. I get it. I get it. You will want to consider and putting it into your inventory. But a lot of these venues, guess what? They already have them, right? So it's nothing, no harm in asking or finding out a way to upsell your your client, right? Until that actual additional add-on. Trust me, if you have two different designs and you show them the effect that the uplighting will provide, I don't know about you, but Betty with the bag gonna want that. So next up is mistake number four, and that's not prioritizing safety, guys. Your draping should not only look stunning, but it should also be secure. You always want to use proper hardware and ensure that everything is securely in place. Safety really should never be compromised. And I'm trying to tell you, sometimes going into it, people don't realize how much fabric that these units can hold especially the basic kit alone. I know a lot of people want to, uh, you know, attract the client that they want to attract and they understand that premium draping takes a lot of drape and it takes height and it takes depth and it takes all these things. However, you cannot design at that magnitude without making sure you have the proper precautions in place because it can tilt over. And I know a lot of people may feel as if, you know, draping is just this thing of putting curtains on a pole, but baby is much more than that. Some of the most common issues when it comes to safety, uh, bad practices is, you know, handling the uprights and pinching fingers is common, but it's real painful guys. So these are things that you need to learn the proper use because I just want y'all to tell me in the comments, you have a pinch of fingers on them uprights? Cause I know I have, and it's painful. Not to mention the base plates, the base plates are long, not only are they sharp and heavy, but they can easily cut your hands or they can easily cut your feet. Like people will set up without the proper shoes on. Like who does that? Like you want to protect your feet at all costs. Even when you're handling your fabric and handling your equipment, you also want to protect your posture. Guys, trust me from someone with a bad back, you do not want to be in this game dealing with uh, premium draping and your back is in flame. So just even practicing good posture, these are all things that's going to help you eliminate those little mishaps that really cause a big deal. And I'm only telling y'all these things because I think I made all of the mistakes, but one that particularly stands out when it comes to safety is we at this venue and we set up a triple layer backdrop. Now, you know, I'm the draping queen, so I'm going to go all out and I want to be bedazzled and I want to do all the things because this is my opportunity to show the world what I could do. Right. So I put all this fabric on, not even taking in consideration the weight of this fabric because I was using a lot of velvet and things like that. So we put it on, we design it, it goes up. And I'm sitting there and it's like a, a disaster happening in slow motion. It's, it was like, is that really about the fall? Is it about the tumble? What's about to happen? And you kind of sit there struck, not knowing what to do, right? But thankfully, my team, everybody kind of seen what was happening and was able to kind of run in and kind of just like protect it from falling. But just that feeling alone, because you know that your brand is on the line, your reputation is on the line. It's like, what in the world is happening? So I'm trying to tell you guys, y'all don't want that feeling. So just go into things, think thoroughly through what it is that you have to do and think about all the safety precautions needed to make sure that you make it out there safe. So let's talk about mistake number five. And that's just simply doing too much. A lot of people overcomplicate the design, right? And I need you to understand that less is often more in event draping, right? Going over and beyond with complex designs can overwhelm the space. It can overwhelm the actual design. I need you guys to focus on elegance, well-executed draping that really enhances the space. And you're gonna be able to do this by always keeping the vision of your client at the focal point, right? Whatever it is that they're looking to achieve, you're not looking to overexert whatever that is. So you can really get a lot more done and a lot more 
eyeballs on what you have and people in love, but just being elegant and simple. A lot of people think you got to put all the swags and all the flowers and all the balloons and all the crystal curtains and the up lights like that is a lot. And it's overwhelming. No element within its own space has an opportunity to kind of shine. Right. So you want to focus on possibly having a focal point in your design. So if your focal point is the swags, let it be the swags, guys. Don't overpower it with a bunch of florals and a bunch of other things. You want one thing to kind of be the center of attention in your design. Think of it as a wedding, right? At the wedding, who is the center of, of, of attention? The bride. So think of your backdrop. Who do you want your bride to be? Is it the valence? Is it the florals? Is it the elements, meaning your tie backs? Is it the... Um, you may be putting gold crystal curtains and gold butterflies or gold anything, right? You want to have one focal point because that is what people are going to really draw their attention to. That's what's going to kind of be the steal of the show. If you have too many steals of the show, you're going to have a big mess. And guys, I got to tell you guys about a time when... Uh, this is probably, I don't know, maybe three years ago. And I was really getting heavily into the triple panel backdrops. And that is a wide space, right? That's about at least 30 feet, anywhere between 24 to 30 feet wide. And that's a lot of space to kind of try and busy up. At least I thought I had to busy it up. So I just remember backdrops for me at that time was super busy and super overpowering. And you now, when I look at it today, I was like, what was I thinking? Like, it's just looked like a big old pot of spaghetti and it really don't have a flow to it. It don't have like a seamless transition in its colors and its design. It looked like a bunch of swags thrown up on a pole. And at the time, I thought I was hot stuff, right? So. <laughs> Take it from me, guys. Sometimes less is more and you don't have to do all that to try and prove a point to somebody that you are a draping stylist or you're a premium draping designer. Realistically, it's all about technique, element, understanding color theory, understanding the swag patterns and different tech. That is where your professionalism is going to come in. And you can have the most basic design, right? But it's going to really tell everything about the designer. It's going to tell if you're skilled. It's going to tell if you know how to match colors. It's going to tell if you know how to pleat. It's going to tell if you know how to create swags. And that's the things you want to focus on, guys. Don't sit here and focus on, I'm going to throw all this stuff in to make it look good because it ain't going to look good. So here we are at our final mistake, which is mistake number six, neglecting client communication as well as any parties that's involved or in charge of the event. Last thing you want to do, guys, is assume. You don't want to assume because you already know what they say about that, right? You always want to communicate. The main thing, like I've always said, understand your client's vision, guys. You want to understand not only their vision, but also the preferences and any specific requirements that they may have. Some of them may be a little wild, but however, you have to take those things into consideration and determine what you can deliver and what you cannot. The main thing is that it ensures you deliver an end result that exceeds their expectations. And this is where you're going to thrive, right? Being able to over deliver. This is how you get your clients to come back. So when you are communicating with your clients, not only you want to find out what it is that they need, but you need to let them know what it is that you need. If you have an intricate design or something that takes extra time, don't you assume that you're just going to get early access to the venue because it don't work that way, right? This is like special requirements. These are special requests. And just because you can say that to the client, guys, does not mean that it's a guarantee. This is where you now need to start communicating with other parties that's in charge of the event, such as the planner or the venue owner or whatever the case may be. Because I'm going to tell you right now, the actual bride or whoever your client is, they are going to tell you, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's good. It's good. You could come on. Baby, don't listen to them. Some key moments when you want to definitely have open dialogue and open communication with your clients is on the most smallest things. Trust me. Just trust me. This is the stuff they actually appreciate, right? It makes them feel what? It makes them feel heard. So even if you're relaying back to their color combination, right? Showing them some examples, 
For me, I love being super involved with my client's entire process. I never have a situation where they give me the vision and I'm off the la-la land to design and then I'm back and say, voila, here I am, magic, and I'm gone. I want them to come along on this journey. I want them to come along with this experience because it'd be small things that they may not like. And if you don't have that open line of communication, you won't know. And there's nothing worse than being on design day and you didn't implement it, something that they don't like. But this can be easily avoided by having those open dialogues. Ask them, is it anything that they don't want to see? Is it any colors that they don't want to see, right? Even if you pick out your color combination and you pick out the fabrics, some colors come with many different hues and many different tints. And the slightest tint, you have some of those brides now, the slightest tint can throw them in a frenzy because they would consider it being off. Whereas realistically, it's not. It's just a different shade, right? So these are things that you can easily take in communication. Even when you're there, guys, when you're there, I know we are designers, right? And when you design, you want to be out, right? Some, some designers stay around because there's a lot of potential in the room. There's a lot of potential clients in the room. But some designers, after they design, they're ready to leave because it's a long time before it's time to strike and break down. So they leave. However, don't just walk off, y'all. Even conveying the message to your client that you are leaving. You don't want your clients to come out and they could be coming out to give you a, a big thanks or they could be coming out to give you a tip. But if you're gone, you miss the opportunity. In addition to that, guys, you can still have communication specifically on the day before the event. This is a big one because sometimes in a lot of instances in which these are good instances, you are able to get access to the venue early on, right? You could get early access as early as a day. You could get a day in advance or you could get a couple hours early. However, it's far in between, but you don't want to assume. So you want to make sure you're in communication with possibly the venue owner, the planner, or whoever is in charge of making that decision. Nine times out of 10, it is not your client. So go beyond, right? Just to make sure that situation, your client is secure, your setup time is secure. You're able to get in and have access because you don't want to be outside somewhere and you, you know, you didn't communicate with this entity, whoever it is, and then you're you're just sitting out there assuming you can get in and you can't. So that is one thing. And another thing is date of the event. Like y'all know it is high anxiety. Everybody is on a thousand on event day, right? So everybody in their feelings, everybody taking things personal. The easiest way to kind of minimize just things happening is to be, be clear, be clear on exactly what it is you can do, what it is you have access to, and what the expectation is of you. Some people will have an expectation of you to set up before them, especially if you're dealing with a lot of vendors. And I don't like going into blind areas or gray areas, right? I like knowing exactly what I'm supposed to do, exactly where I'm supposed to set up, what time I'm supposed to set up. And this makes me be able to operate at my highest level of being able to operate as opposed to just going in and I'm just like, well, where do I go? What do I do? What do you know, you don't want to have that kind of um, experience. You are the designer, right? It's going to lower your excitement. It's going to lower your energy levels. And you need to be on a thousand at, at the best of your at the best of your operational level. So easily do that. Communicate with all parties necessary the day before the day of and after the event wraps, if you did an amazing job and people seen it and you were in communication with other vendors or venue owners or been in communication with your client, you already know what that's going to equate. They coming back when they going they going to book you for for more uh, experiences because the experience was that great. But on the flip side, if you don't, I'm trying to tell you, it could be a disaster. <laughs> and I am only sharing this because I know what that feels like. Right. And that's why I feel like this was one of the mistakes I had to put in this video, because I had a client and I clearly communicated to the client the design that they was requesting or that they booked me for would take extra time. And I told him I needed an extra hour, additional hour. And you you know what the client said. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you could get it. You could get in there early. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We good. We good. <laughs> if you ever hear you, we good. Run. <laughs> so that was the, the correspondence. And I got there and the door was locked. 
There were no cars in the, the driveway, no cars in the uh, parking lot. No one, no sign of anybody, no other vendors, no nothing. So I'm sitting there. Of course, I'm calling my client. I'm unable to get through and which is understandable because it's, it's, you know, bride day, wedding day. So it was just a, a really uncomfortable experience because I literally had to sit there. I had to sit there outside the venue and it was raining. <laughs> so just all this ball of emotions is happening. And I still got to go in here with my happy face on and design and do all these things that's expected of me. However, I don't feel that great about the experience that just happened. But at Liberty, I took accountability that I should have made sure that I had the access I needed and I should have been able or should have just taken the initiative to contact who I needed to get the clearance I needed. And that was a lesson I learned, which is why I'm sharing it with you guys. That wraps up today's episode on the common mistakes newbies make. Avoiding these mistakes really going to set you guys on the path to becoming the top-notch event designer that you're looking to be, right? And if you found this video to be helpful, show your girl some love and drop a like and subscribe to the best draping podcast on the internet. And guys, let's keep this conversation going and let me know what are some mistakes you made. We're doing a free giveaway on one of our books, which is the Backdrop Blueprint. And this can be found on Amazon, so we'll drop a link to that. Now, the person who has has the most interesting story on their biggest mistake wins the ebook. So don't be shy, guys. Share some stories in the comments below. You'll be surprised at who did the same thing. I want to thank you guys again for tuning in to Raising the Ball. I am your girl, Precious Stevens, aka the Draping Queen, signing out.